So great to be back with you all. Thank you for allowing me to come. I did not hug any strangers in the airport this week, so you'll be glad to hear about that. For those of you who were here last Sunday, if you missed the sermon, go back and watch it. You'll get that whole story. We're going to dive right into the Word uh, this morning and want to uh, spend some time in Nehemiah, mostly chapter 4. We'll look at a couple of verses in chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles, please go ahead and turn there as we continue this study from the book of Nehemiah. Um, entitled New Beginnings. So last Sunday we asked the following question, what do we do, what do I do when the walls of my life collapse? And I encourage you to dwell on a couple of things this past week. First of all, just from the perspective of you personally, when the walls of your life implode, collapse, remember that um, you're consecrated. Remind yourself of that. I am consecrated. I'm set apart through the blood of Jesus and I am restored through the sacrifice of Jesus, and I am not alone. So no matter where you go, you are never, ever by yourself. The Holy Spirit of God is always there prompting and guiding. And then we, collectively as a body, we remember that in Christ we are next to one another. Remember as they were working on the wall and they were working side by side next to each other? Well, that's how we are designed to operate as the body of Christ, that we're in this together. And uh, together we will be victorious, not because of our own efforts, but because Christ Jesus already reigns victorious, amen? And we're just following his lead. Uh, The love of God cures us, the love of God cures others, and uh, Jesus is the one we proclaim, even if we have sung about and talked about already during our time together this morning. So I just wanted to refresh your memory as we begin today of where we were last Sunday and talk a little bit today and modify that question just ever so slightly and look at it from a different perspective, and that is, what do we do as the body of Christ when the walls of someone else's life collapse? And um, anybody in the room know someone whose life is a mess right now? Anybody? Uh, okay, we're probably going to, if we don't know someone right now, we probably will pretty soon. Um, and some of us can relate, right? Because we've been in those situations in our own lives when the walls have kind of come falling down and we uh, gave our heart and our head, hopefully, to the Lord for restoration. That's what I want to talk about a little bit today. So let's back up just a little bit. Uh, we're going to be, as I said, in chapter 4, but let's look a little bit in chapter 2 just to kind of set the stage of the dynamic that's taking place here because as Nehemiah and the Jewish leaders and many other workers are coming together to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, they're meeting some opposition. And we read about that opposition uh, in Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. So I I told the priests and the nobles and those who would be rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had sent to me. And so this is Nehemiah talking. And um, they replied, let us start rebuilding. And remember, this is this verse that we said is one of the most beautiful verses in in all of the Old Testament. And so they began this good work, very similar to how you as a congregation have begun the good work in this season of interim. But here's what happens. And I I don't think I'm exaggerating, over-exaggerating by saying what I'm going to say next. Here's what always happens. And that is when God starts to move, Satan doesn't sit still. So in verse 19, chapter 2, but when Sanballat, this is a name of Babylonian origin, so someone who's already against Jerusalem, when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What's this you're doing, they ask? Are you rebelling against the king? The criticism doesn't stop there. The work is now well underway, as we're about to see in chapter 4. And as the work continues to progress, these guys come back. And here's what we see, beginning in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 1. When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. That just means he was about to blow his stack, okay? He was really, really furious, frustrated. And so he ridicules the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? 
Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they're building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stone. So these guys were just hurling insults and within earshot of those who were already on the wall, right? They're trying to intimidate. They're trying to frustrate. Uh, They're trying to bully them into uh, giving up the work. But then something incredible happens, as so often happens in the book of Nehemiah, and that is prayer breaks in. They don't even get to finish the rest of the insults (laughs) before Nehemiah turns his attention to prayer. But I want you to notice it's a subtle shift, but it's a very powerful shift. Because in the first few chapters of Nehemiah, we see again and again and again, Nehemiah prayed. But do you see those first couple of pronouns in verse 4? What are they? Hear us our God. So a man of prayer has led God's people to prayer. So here's a little side note. If you think your prayers don't make a difference, think again. And the prayer of the people here is recorded for us as you see on screen. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. And then there's this, the fancy term for it is an imprecatory prayer, okay? Kind of a rain down fire on them God (laughs) kind of prayer. And so he says, turn their insults back on their own heads. This is the people praying. Give them over as plunder uh, in a land of captivity. And, And basically let them become, let the captors become captive, okay? Basically is what he's praying here. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Another way to think about that is they have thrown insults into the face of God's people. So, we're not going to let them get to us, parenthetically. We rebuilt the wall until it reached half its height. For the people worked, don't you just love this phrase? The people worked with all their heart. So what happens when the people of God work together with all their heart? You think Satan's going to pay attention to that? Absolutely, because I want you to notice what happens next. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. And so now they plot together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But what is the response again? We prayed to our God and posted guard day and night to meet this threat. And so here's what happens. This back and forth continues for the rest of the chapter. So the more threats that his people endure, the more Nehemiah prays. And the more he prays, the more threats they endure. Uh, The more the people work, the more insults and threats they endure. And the more insults and threats they endure, the more the people work. But it's not at this point just about the wall. It's about something greater than the wall. It's about actually fulfilling the purposes of God. And so Sanballat and his entourage, they begin this propaganda campaign. And it doesn't matter if it contains truth or not. Uh, It just matters that the Jews stop listening to God, right? Right? and start listening to the opponents of God. And so the threats are like this. Your work is so poor that if a fox came up and put his paw on the wall, that wall would crumble down. And and the tactics that are used against the builders of that which belongs to God, the tactics have not changed at all. I mean, we're talking almost 3,000 years, and the tactics have not changed. Truth no longer matters very much in our culture, right? Right? Truth is what you make it. It may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Let's all do whatever we want and life will be great. Well, I think we're kind of discovering there's uh, some cracks in that foundation of thought, right? Absolutes such as Jesus is the only way. He is the way, the truth, the life. Those absolutes, those have gone out of style. 
in the hearts and minds of many people worldwide. But people who've been consecrated, people who've been set apart as sacred uh, to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, we're not just people who follow a version of the truth, right? We are people of the truth, the truth that is only found in and through Jesus. And if we believe otherwise, I think it's because we've allowed our hearts um, to experience the same thing that the Jews on the wall begin to experience. And I want you to notice what happens. I want you to notice what happens when we begin to listen to voices who are opposed to God's will and not just listen to them but begin to allow them to creep into um, how we think about and how we view the world. Nehemiah 4.10. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there's so much, there's so much rubble. We can't rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we will kill them, and we'll put an end to all the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they're going to attack us. And so do you see how discouragement began to creep into the minds of the Jewish people? Do you see how criticism And threats begin to wear on them. Do you see how quickly a few obstacles can lead to a the sky is falling mindset? So I just want to challenge you. May we we always remember that we are a people who have been, here's our term from last Sunday, consecrated. We're set apart um, as sacred to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're not a people who fall for threats. We don't fall for lies. We don't measure success by worldly definitions and and metrics. Nehemiah certainly didn't. In response to the lies and the threats from the outside and and, and in response to the withering spirit uh, from the inside, he actually lives even more fervently into his mission. So we see this unfold in chapter 4 and verse 13. Therefore, I stationed some of my people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. And then I love this phrase in Nehemiah 4.16. From that day on. I just think that's such a powerful phrase. From that day on, I want you to notice what happens. Half work on the wall and half watch for the enemy. The suppliers carry materials in one hand and a weapon in the other. The builders kept a sword by their side. And the rallying trumpet was going to rally the people in case of an emergency was always on standby, always ready to sound. We read in Nehemiah 4 in verse 20, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. And then this beautiful, powerful, wonderful phrase, our God will fight for us. So as you think about all that's happening here, there's just several pieces of this dynamic that I want to draw your attention to. Just a few things. First, Nehemiah and the people of God, they made a plan and they worked the plan. Uh, that, that was a plan that was bathed in prayer. We've talked about that quite often for the past several weeks. It was a plan that was also filled with faith. There was some wavering in the beginning, but Nehemiah reminded them of who they were and whose they were, and they got back to work. Their plan was adaptable. 
If they needed to make some adjustments, they had the ability to do that. And their plan also withstood opposition. And so I just want to ask you a couple of questions this morning. Can you imagine building a house without plans? Can you imagine that? You go to the bank and you say, hey, we're going to build a house and um, we'd like to uh, get a loan, please, to build the house. And the bank says, hey, sure, we'd love to partner with you on that. Could we see some house plans, please? And you just say, ah, we're just kind of going to wing it. You know, what loan officer is going to say, hey, well, let's just go over here and sign the papers, right? I mean, you can't, you can't build a house that way. Would you consider starting a business without a business plan? People who try that generally, how successful are they in business? Usually not very successful, right? Can you imagine ASU football with no coaching? Be nice, okay, be nice. But seriously, how successful would any team be if before the game the coach just said, oh, guys, uh, they're pretty big. So I would just say try to run faster maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's just silly, right? It's just silly. If we're going to build... If we're going to engage, we, we, we've got to have a plan. And that's just half the battle. Making the plan is just half the battle. As I've said earlier, a plan is only as good as our desire to work it. And someone might say, hey, but, but planning, doesn't that just take away trusting the leading of the Spirit? Well, my response to that is make sure that you invite the Spirit to the planning party. God needs to be very much a part of this. Where there is no plan, when we just live into whatever feels right, and it's quite frankly a, a plague upon our culture right now, we just live into what feels right. And so when there is no plan, I believe there is a much greater chance of chaos ultimately in our lives. I'll tell you about my friend Josh. Josh and I met on a Sunday morning about three years ago. Um, I wasn't preaching that morning. So my wife and I were able to sit up in the balcony at the A&M Church of Christ. And um, don't usually sit up there because my responsibility is I'm typically sitting down front, close to the front. But I helped pass communion that morning and the collection trays. That was 2019 B.C., before COVID. Uh, we passed trays. You may remember that. But after passing the collection plates, I, I noticed I'd never seen him before. And so I just walked down and just tapped him on the shoulder. And, and he jumped like he was shot. I'm telling you, it was amazing. Uh, it's not a great evangelism strategy, by the way, but, uh, you know, be a little, a little less subtle in your approaches to people you don't know. But we visited a little bit uh, afterward, at the close of the service and afterward, and I asked him, I said, hey, can I, can I treat you to lunch this week? And uh, he agreed, and we met at a local restaurant, and um, Josh was a believer, but he was a long way from being a disciple of Jesus. And you know there's a big difference, right? A lot of people can believe but being a disciple is, is very different. Um, Josh had struggled mightily in his teen years and 20s and 30s. Um, significant, significant uh, drug abuse, uh, alcohol abuse. Um, he'd been homeless multiple times. Grew up in a broken home. Never had a father figure, really. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of mental health issues going on with mom. Um, he got married in his early 20s, fathered a child, uh, divorced in his late 20s. And that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg, okay? Tell you a whole lot more. And by the way, Josh has been very open about his story, so I'm not disclosing anything this morning that, that others uh, have not heard. But by the time he got to our church, he was uh, spiritually and emotionally, physically, mentally, he was just exhausted. Now, on the outside, it was a really well put together facade, and I'll explain that more here in just a moment. But on the inside, 
he was just dying a, a very slow but a very sure death. And during lunch and in a couple of subsequent meetings, found out that he didn't know much about the Bible at all. Uh, he didn't know anything about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. But here's one thing he did know. He knew he wanted a future that was very different than his past. He knew that. So he was ready for God to begin rebuilding uh, the foundations of the walls of his life. And, uh, and here's the deal. There is no way in the world he could have done that by himself. No way. Uh, just the gravitational pull of the flesh would have just been too much, would have been too overwhelming. So we met often during subsequent weeks, and in November of 2019, uh, he surrendered his life to Jesus, and he was baptized. And after that, sometimes he would have a great week. Sometimes he would have a rotten week. Sometimes he made really, really good decisions, and sometimes, sometimes he didn't. He made a lot of our church members laugh. He made a lot of our church members anxious. <laughs> um, but I just kept praying for him, and several other people did too. And we just kept texting him, and we just kept checking in on him. And we studied together, and we laughed together, and we cried together, and we prayed together. Slowly but surely, a disciple of Jesus began to emerge. Slow but sure. And he now leads one of our small groups. So he manages a men's clothing store, and it's a high-end men's clothing store. And I stopped by there on Friday uh, before I uh, came out here. We spent about an hour together just talking about life and uh, church and business. And he's a long way from perfect. But I want to ask you a question. Um, who among us is? In my relationship with Josh, I describe it this way. I had to become to him a, a beehive, not B-E-E -E hive, but I used the phrase beehive, B-E hive, <laughs> to help me remember a few things about our relationship. Uh, I had to be prayerful. And there were a lot of times I didn't really know what was going to happen in the next 24 hours. Uh, so I, sometimes I just had to just pray. I didn't have advice. I didn't have counsel because it was a pretty tough week or a pretty tough day. I had to uh, be patient. Boy, did I have to be patient. And he'll tell you that. <laughs> he'll tell you the same thing. Um, I had to be prepared for mistakes. Because when someone who has not been living for Jesus starts living for Jesus, how can we expect them just to flip a switch and say everything and do everything and understand everything and get everything, you know, every single time that, that's always going to honor God, right? If someone is coming from a posture of unbelief, how would we expect them to act? Well, I'm going to say most of the time like an unbeliever, right? But we love them into and we are patient with them into and we pray them hopefully prayerfully into that relationship with the Lord. That's when we see the uh, changes take place. I had to be prepared for hard questions I had to be prepared for the unexpected. I had to be flexible in exercising my faith when to push him and when to pull him along, while at the same time being resolute in my faith by not compromising my own values. So I had to be open about my own sin. And also had to be open about what God was teaching me. And I'll tell you this story really quick. God taught me a lot. <laughs> and he still is teaching me a lot in this relationship journey that we're on. So I'll tell you this story very quickly. I know our time is getting, getting uh, long here. But um, 
So Josh managed this, this clothing store. Now, I've never been in a men's high-end clothing store in my life. Okay, I need to make that disclaimer. If people ask me, oh, so what do you wear? Uh, Armani? Uh, Gucci? No, I, I, was, I wear Sam's, okay, as in from Sam's Club. That's, uh, you know, or Goodwill. You know, that's where I do a lot of my shopping. eBay, you know, uh, if you say it with a French accent, it sounds a whole lot better, I think. But anyway, um, so, so the first day that he is, this is a brand new job for him. It's his dream job. This is something he's wanted to do forever. The first day I show up right as the store opens, I said, I said I'm going to be your first customer. I'm going to be your first customer. Oh, that's awesome. You know, you'll always remember it. I'm your first customer. Oh, man, that's so great. Thank you. And I said, he's like, what do you need? And I said, you know, maybe just a pair of pants. I'll just get a pair of pants, right? I mean, how much can a pair of pants be, right? I, I don't know. So I buy these pants that I'm wearing, okay? I won't tell you the name because I, I don't even remember. But I get the pants. He measures and cuts. We go up to the counter, and he says, I'm not making this up. He says, that'll be $178. And I said, what? <laughs> Seriously? So here's a very important lesson for those of you who go into an upscale men's store. Ask about, where are your socks? Okay, start there. <laughs> start there. So I wore these pants every day for like two months, okay? Slept in them, jogged in them. I mean, you know. I was like, what in the world? There's like the gold and the stitching. What is going on? I will say, by the way, they're very comfortable. And they do look stylish, right? Don't you think? So I hope so. Uh, but anyway, God taught me hey, it's all going to work itself out. And I think the most I'd spent on a pair of pants like in the previous year was $15. So it all works out. I'm here to walk with this, this young man and be in the places, the difficult spaces, the difficult times, because I think, I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Are we going to spend the rest of our lives as Christians? Are we going to spend the rest of our lives worrying about how our world is falling apart? Or are we going to try to go find people and minister to people whose worlds are falling apart? And I think that's a question worth wrestling with. Nehemiah 4.14, we read, after I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, the rest of the people, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of these naysayers. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. Fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. So, so just a couple of questions as we close. What's the point of, of today's lesson? And I want you to know it's, it's you, church. You're the point of the lesson. I want to challenge you. Don't be afraid of anyone. Don't be afraid of anything. God's got this. Let's be a church. Let's be a church who fights for our, our families. And no, we're not going to pick up swords and, <laughs> and rocks like they did back at this time. But we're going to fight with different weapons. A weapon of truth. The weapon of God's word. The weapon of love. The weapon of peace. The weapon of patience. You know, those, are, those are going to be our weapons. Prayer. But, but fight for your families and fight for your sons and daughters and fight for your spouses and fight for your homes and fight for those who don't yet know Jesus. I want to remind you, there is a huge difference in fighting with someone and fighting for someone. And quite frankly, in churches of Christ, we need to do a much better job of fighting for one another. And stop fighting with one another so much. In the body of Christ, also, we talk to each other, not about each other. And if we could just remember those two truths, I think it would make a world of difference. Next Sunday, I want to begin a step-by-step -step process with you. We'll call that a plan. Uh, to show you some very specific ways that you can engage individually, uh, that you individually and collectively can, can engage others in very meaningful ways that lead, I, I hope and pray, to profound life change. And so between now and then, I just want to ask you to pray, pray a couple of things. First, pray fervently that God 
lead you into one simple conversation with one person whose walls have collapsed or at a minimum are showing some signs of wear and tear. Um, Josh jokes with me all the time. He said, don't you regret tapping me on the shoulder that Sunday? And I say to him every time, brother, I wouldn't have changed it for the world. Not for the world. So between now and Sunday, pray that God will lead you into at least one conversation. Just a, just a starting place. We'll see what God does with that. And when God answers that prayer, and I believe that he will, and he puts you into that space, I would encourage you to listen more than you talk. God can do great things with a simple conversation, particularly in conversations where we listen more than we speak. So here's my challenge to you. Have one of those conversations. The story may never be told from this stage. It may never be heralded to the world, but it will forever be trumpeted in heaven. And that's a story worth telling.